Welcome to a Dead Squirrel in the Woods podcast. I am Nicholas, one of your hosts. And I'm Callie. So, Nicholas, uh, what are we covering today? Well, uh, we've been talking about the Michigan Triangle, and so far we've only covered ships. So true, Nicholas. So you did mention that this area was active in many weird ways? Yes, not just ships, and we do still have more on ships that could be future episodes. But there are um, UFOs, um, air, weird airplane events, um, so, you know, we, I figured since we did cover the seas, I was thinking maybe it's time to head to the skies. That sounds like a wonderful place to cover. I hear so many things happen there. So, have you ever had to fly commercial airlines? Although it's not my favorite, I've had a few flights. Okay. Did you ever have turbulence? Eh. Yeah, not too much. Not no, too much. So, some pretty clean flights. Yeah. Right. Well, many people are afraid of flying. Did you know that? Well, I've heard about it a few times. Okay, well, however, according to the National Safety Council, the NSC, you are 95% more likely to die of accidental poisoning. Accidental? That is crazy. Also, 1 in 1.9 million is the chance of getting hit by lightning. Mm -hmm. And 1 in 100... Uh, result in, car, in a, a car crash result in death. Are you currently uh, learning to drive? Why, yes I am. Huh. Well, you know, next time you take that long trip, it'd probably be safer to fly. <laughs> yeah. More expensive, too. So, driving is more dangerous than flying because 1 in 11 million um, die in a plane crash. That or chances crazy. chances of dying in a plane crash. Still insane. So planes don't collide very often. It's actually a very safe travel method. However, planes do crash, and in most cases, the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, is able to, you know, determine the cause of that crash. Wait, did you just say most? What do you mean most? Well, yes, I did just say most, and we are talking about the Michigan Triangle here, so you should figure that there's some mysteries to this. And we did talk about ships and the mysteries surrounding them, and a lot of that was unexplained. That, I mean, I guess if, like, the, like, the lakes are mysterious, then maybe the planes would be too. No, that is a good assumption. So, let's let's start with, how about Flight 2501? Have you heard of this flight? No, but if no. it's anything like the ships, I bet it doesn't end well. No, it, well, let's not spoil anything here, but um, we are talking about paranormal and disappearances in the Michigan Triangle, so you're probably correct. Now, it was the evening of June 23rd, 1950. It was a warm and humid day in LaGuard at LaGuardia Airport um, in the state of New York. There was a gentle breeze out of the south. You know, that just sounds relaxing and like a routine flight. So, if that's all there is, a normal day, then what's the weird part about this? Well, as we go, it gets a little more odd and um, crazy. Well, this flight was an added flight to the schedule for Northwest Orient Airlines. Now, this was due to all the regular scheduled flights that fly from New York to Minneapolis, all were booked. So they added a flight to the schedule. And wouldn't you know it, this flight sold out as well. Well, you know, I was on TikTok 
And I saw a lot of people complaining about Northwest, I mean Southwest flights. There was a lot of people stuck there. So it's good that they added another flight. Yes, um, you know, they, they had a way to provide services that their patrons needed. So, you know, flight 2501 left close to the maximum weight allowed at about 7.30 p.m. Um, now, what kind of plane was flight 2501? Well, this was a DC-4, and its tail number was N95425, and it had four big engines. So this, this plane was built just fine, because this was built for the U.S. Army Air Forces by Douglas Aircraft Company in 1943. Wait. U.S. Army Air Forces? Does that mean this was a military plane? Well, yes. At one point, it was a military plane. That was its original purpose. Now, at time to time, the government sells off surplus equipment. Well, they did this in 1945, and this plane was one that was turned into a commercial plane. So it was no longer for military use? No, they refitted it for their purposes, and... Um, so they could actually, you know, fly commercial. Now, in pre-flight review, the radar showed a line of thunderstorms and squalls in between New York and Minneapolis. But, you know, for this plane, that would just cause more of a bumpy flight. Not really a safety issue. Okay, so there's bad weather, there's thunderstorms, but you said it was manageable. How did that go for the ships, though, in our past stories? Well, that was not very good for those ships, but, you know, we'll get into that later. Okay, well, normally planes don't have problems with big storms, so, you know, there's that. Um, and if you're an experienced pilot, you can get through it. Now, Captain Lind, he, he kept his passengers in mind. And so, you know, and at that time, you normally flew at 6,000 feet. Well, he requested with the air traffic control to fly at 4,000 feet to kind of smooth the flight out. But... So, he wanted to smooth the flight out for his passengers, but, I mean, it's a good thing that he did that, to want to yeah. make it smoother, yeah. and avoid those. Yeah, that was, I mean, you know, like we said, a lot of people have a fear of flying, and I'm sure in the 1950s it was you know, even more scary. Mm -hmm. So, he was, of course, denied, um, due to conflicting patterns with other planes and traffic in the airspace. Mm -hmm. So when he got to Cleveland around, this was around 10 p.m., well, he decided to ask air traffic control if he could go down to 4,000 feet. And when, you know what, <laughs> this time he was approved. Oh, wow. Yeah, and this provided a very uneventful path ahead. So, it can't be that easy. It's not right there that something has to complicate things. Yeah, something will complicate things. That you should, it's funny that you should ask that, because we always have a twist, right? So, in the 1950s, flights relied on a system of low-frequency radio navigation. They called it LFR. And this was invented by a British engineer, Frank Abcock. Now, I'm not going to go into all the boring details of how radio waves bounce here, there, whatever. It, it was a very functional system. Okay, so you have this low-frequency radio, and it's built like this British engineer. What's the twist? Well, I guess, I guess I've put it off long enough. As the flight got closer to Battle Creek, Michigan, another plane drifted down to the same altitude as flight 251. This led to 251 
being told to go down to 3,500 feet. Hmm. Well, I guess I put it off a little longer because, you know, Captain Lind was just fine with this because it was actually a smoother space to fly in. But for some reason, they chose to steer south and to go around the storms. Okay, so these planes are 500 feet apart and they're just trying to avoid the storms. What's the issue with that? What's the twist? Well, you remember when I said there was thunderstorms and squalls? Yeah. Well, this led them into the squalls on the radar. This is normally not an issue in most cases. It's more of an annoyance. Um, it'll cause turbulence, you know. Most pilots can get through this. So around... 11, 13 p.m.? Flight 2501 made one final transmission. Oh. They requested to descend to 2,500 feet. And they gave no reason for this request. That's odd. Yes. I, I would like to know the reason, but that we'll never know that. It is thought it was to get a visual perspective on where they were along the shoreline. And, of course, due to traffic clearance um, schedules, they were not allowed to do this. Now, they were in the vicinity of Benton Harbor, Michigan. So, shortly after this request, many residents of small towns between Benton Harbor, Michigan and South Haven, Michigan, reported hearing a low-flying plane along the shore and then a brilliant flash of light. Wait, a flash? I mean, the low plane, that must have been flight 2501, but what was the flash? Yes, I, I don't know. So they must have went down in elevation anyway. So after the flash was reported, not long after, like quickly after, it was a, there was a reported explosion. What? Yeah, an explosion. So Mitchell Field requested the flight location, but got no response from the flight. Hoping it was radio issues and just, you know, they just weren't working properly. Like maybe, you know, flight 2501 couldn't, couldn't talk out, but mm -hmm. they could hear. They instructed the plane to circle the range station at Madison, Wisconsin. Now, after some time not seen or being contacted, they, they knew the flight was missing. So, rescue, you know, rescue searches were dispatched right away. Okay, so first we have this aircraft that flight 2501 that wants to fly low and then their elevation's dropping and then there's this flash of light and an explosion i mean how do you just explain that that i mean something had to have caused that i mean wait what happened to the first plane we're talking about did these two crash into each other you know that's a good theory and there's a lot of theories on this now whatever it is that happened a few days later um, in the search turned up some gruesome discoveries of the lives lost. Debris started debris started washing ashore and the beaches were actually shut down. New evidence recovered showed the aircraft hit the water at a high speed in a forward, downward, and a little to the left angle. Wow. I mean, so there are probably theories as to why this happened, right? I mean, there seems really odd. There has to be a reason, and without us knowing. Yeah, why would, why would it be aimed downward? So, you know. So they were going they went, for the water. Yeah, if they, well, based on the eyewitness reports along the small towns, there was a low-flying plane. 
Now, one of the theories is lightning strike. A lightning strike. Okay. Remember the odds I said that a human would get hit by lightning? Well, okay, they were going through squalls and thunderstorms, so some have surmised that maybe the plane was hit by lightning. As a, and this would have resulted in a spark. But the odd thing is there was no sign of a fire in the wreckage. And there was also no sign of failure. A Douglas Aircraft Company investigator thinks that the severe wind and the storm and being disorientated caused the aircraft to crash. Which, you know, sounds about right. I mean, mm-hmm. that is... That's a po- good possibility. Now, that being said... Pilots have had no issue recovering from this low of an altitude before. So, um, if they were at the 2,500 feet, this would have been something they could have recovered from. Mm -hmm. Um, Some also think the craft was taken by UFOs. Now, there is some debris, so, I mean, not everything was taken by the UFOs, but um, this, you know... The fuel to this fire with the UFO theory is that no large pieces have been recovered. Or its engines. And as of today, it's still not found. So this case still has no determined probable cause. No logical reason this happened. Yeah, I kind of like that UFO theory. Very, very, um... It kind of fits in with this mysteriousness. But... So, they didn't recover any of the big parts, but what about all those people? Well, there were some chunks of skull. Um, One reported was about the size of a half dollar. Um, Hands, ears, armrests from the plane. uh, A chunk of a spine. Also, a passenger's checkbook was washed up. Um, So... There is record of the people. That is so gruesome. I mean, can you imagine how scared those passengers were? Yeah. That, I mean... So what would you say if if I told you that this is not the only tale of a crash like that in the Michigan Triangle? A crash? The only what? Are you saying that there's more? Oh, there's plenty more, and I don't think we're going to fit it all in this episode. But, let's go to the next one. United Airlines Flight 389. Just as Northwest Orient Flight 2501. Now, this one, we move 15 years in the future. Okay. This happens August 16th, 1965, so pretty close to almost exactly 15 years. Yeah. Now, this flight was also departing from LaGuardia, New York, on a warm, humid summer evening. Does that sound familiar? You know, this sounds almost too familiar. Yeah, too so, good to be true. Okay, so 24 passengers and 6 crew members boarded... The new state-of-the-art Boeing 727-100. Don't you think it's weird that the other one was like this two-month-old plane and now this one's like a state-of-the-art plane? Yeah, the other one was that military plane with all those big engines and, you know, shouldn't have any problems. And and this one is a brand new plane, pretty much. Yeah, it's... So now, this was a routine scheduled flight offered by United going from New York to Chicago. This plane was about two months old, so I'm assuming it was a, you know, pretty good plane. Um, And it was stated there, like I said. So you're probably thinking, well, what the weather was like. Well, there was, there were high clouds and little turbulence. So this was like one of your dream flights. You, You get on it, you just... You know, no issues. You could probably fall asleep on the flight, you know. Um, And the flight took off 
at about 7.50 p.m. And there was no expectation of any kind of trouble. Um, nothing's, nothing, no red flags went up that there was going to be trouble. Um, so, there, there's expected to be no trouble? I mean, what do you mean by that? What happened this time? We're talking about it. Well, alright, so, now things are going as expected. And until a little bit of time left in the flight, of course, it's always the end. Mm-hmm. Kind of like when you're driving home and you have no problems on your trip and right before you get home that's when you have your accident or you know you get pulled over for speeding or whatever you know that's when your it just happened Mm -hmm. well the passengers would have been getting ready for arrival and then and the pilot will radio to get his final landing instructions and accept them okay this just sounds like a normal flight yeah But, this is where things kind of go off the rails. Seconds after talking to air traffic control and getting their landing directions. Seconds after. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well. A lifeguard at Chicago's North Avenue Beach House reported a brilliant orange flash on the horizon. And then... (laughs) There was a thunderous roar. Wait, doesn't this sound really similar to what happened last time, too? I mean, yeah, the, the flash, the and flash, but the roar. The roar's new. Yeah, there was a explosion. So is this roar an explosion? A, I don't know. So, you know, the um, description... Or, well, this happens, right? And all the, you know, this in this area, and the Coast Guard facilities become flooded with calls. But the real weird thing is that Flight 389 vanished from the radar, and it was on its descent to the airport. Wait, so it's so close to the airport, and it's just gone like that? Yeah, gone. No longer there. Poof, gone. Now, imagine being at the terminal in the airport, waiting for the flight, and this flight just disappeared, but you're just at the dock where it's supposed to have to appear and greet your loved ones. Wait, so these poor, like, family members, I mean, how do you just tell someone that, yeah, your family member went missing on a flight and we can't track it anymore? I mean, and like the workers in their family, like, I mean, that poor airport is going to have to get new, like hire new people now and everything. Yeah, and I bet you some of them were, some of them, they had friends that were on that plane maybe, or, you know, like the pilots knew each other, um, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, they, the co-workers lost people too. It was... 30 people, I said 24 passengers, 6 crew, so, so yeah, this was just tragic for all involved. Now, right after, an informal search team was assembled right away at the North Shore Yacht Club, okay? They found twisted metal and hunks of fiberglass. Now, the informal investigation was just people starting to try to, f- to find this flight and maybe recover people maybe hopefully people lived in it maybe they just landed in the ocean yeah or the lake mm-hmm. you know so but in the morning a formal recovery with the coast guard and navy vessels um did search now this search lasted a year one whole year. A year? And how much do you think this costs? Oh, it's gotta be a lot of money. I mean, if it's a year, I'm gonna say a hundred thousand. Half a million. Half a million. Half a million. And in 1950, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so, or 1965, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. The other one was 1950. 
So. So yeah. Um, Wait. So they are looking out there for a year, right? And yeah. they're in this lake. Why were they out there so long? I mean, what well, was? Well, what they were actually looking for was the plane's black box, and this is what holds the flight data. Oh, okay. okay. This is what they can look at the diagnostics, the dial, um, you know, the avionautics, and see. And it, kind of like in your car, you know, when your check engine light comes on or whatever, mm-hmm. they can see where the problem is or, or what happened. Now, they never found this. And after examining all of what they had, they had to formulate their theories from that. Wait, so there's only theories about what happened? They don't even know yet? I mean, what do, like, the officials think? Well, that's very interesting because there is some crazy weird stuff going on here. Now... I don't know how to respond to that. (laughs) Well, technology. Apple Watch is just like to talk when they feel like. Siri doesn't even know. Yeah, you don't even say her name and she talks. (laughs) Well, that's a mystery in itself <laughs> right there. Is the government listening? Yeah, maybe. So, okay. Now, some of this stuff does not even seem possible that they're theorizing, okay? Now, this crash made the stock of Boeing drop. And there was consideration of even grounding all Boeing planes. All of them? Yes, every single one. Now... That didn't happen, of course, but they concluded that the flight had struck the water nose up. How? How can you go nose up? That just seems crazy. So, now to add to this, there was no sign that there was a fire before the plane hit the water. And we said it was on its descent. The landing gear was out and ready to land. Okay, so... There are no problems. Like, they're about to land. It's, like, doing super good. And then it just is nose up and then gone? Yes. And to add to this, there is three experienced pilots with clear weather and a relatively new plane. So, really, what happened? I mean, that's so odd. Okay, now, this is where it gets even weirder. The first altitude that was recorded at 9.14 p.m. showed the plane at 16,500 feet on its descent to 14,000. So, you know, within 15 years, they started flying even higher. Yeah, that's like a whole 10,000 more feet. Yeah, so now, the crazy part to this is at 9.19 elevation was moving was to they were to move to the elevation of 6,000 feet because they were about ready to land right but the data showed the flight was at 2,000 feet so that means if the flight thought it was at 12,000 feet it would be 10,000 feet off on their gauges yeah, so without a black box, we can't explain why it was that off. What malfunctioned? Huh. So this is the official, this is what really happened? This is, is what is... Or is this a theory? Theory. Wow, that so, is a terrifying theory. But you said this is just one theory. Yeah, what but, else could have happened? But I don't get how they... So if they thought they were lower, how did the plane crash with nose up? Do they mean straight up or just kind of in the air? Do you think they noticed and then they couldn't stop themselves and went up? And Yeah, I don't know. That is so weird. And yeah. wouldn't they be able to like, look out like the windows and see that they're yeah. closer to the water than yeah, 10,000 feet? Yeah, you would think that. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Huh. So now... <laughs> Another theory which you're going to love. There are some who believe that UFOs made the gauges malfunction. Now, there's no proof of this. 
and you know the black box is missing so I guess that might add some fuel to the fire maybe the aliens knew that or the craft knew that they needed the black box so that can't be explained I don't know but you know um, there are some if you remember the X-Files oh wait you're not that old I'm the one who would remember that the truth is out there you know, I think that just shows how old you really are. That 27-year age difference is just peaking right now. I mean, these have been some interesting stories, but... So, whatever happened will just remain unexplained in both stories. So, um, you know, there are plenty more mysteries in the Lake Michigan Triangle. We have just scratched the surface. You know, going into this, I did not think I would find as much as I did. So, I don't know. So, you said there's more mysteries. So yeah. We're going to come back to this. Yeah, I think I think we'll have to take a break from this, and this will be part two. We have part one. And, you know, part three will come later in the season. Maybe we'll, um, as more research comes, uh, this topic has intrigued me. Yeah, I think it's enjoying our viewers too. And with that, thank you for watching. Our, thank you for listening to our podcast. I hope you loved it. Come back for more episodes soon. And remember to listen to the bonus content releasing next week. <laughs>